Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Kyle Mitchell with APT Capital Group. Uh, he's based in Phoenix, Tucson market, uh, but personally lives uh, you know, uh, on the West Coast uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, so it's a pleasure, uh, Kyle, to have you. Uh, Kyle has been investing for uh, 10 years. Uh, he has done several deals so far. Uh, he has about 17 million uh, at assets under management. And uh, his uh, and his group's mission is to pro- positively impact the lives of investors and the communities that they invest with highest level of transparency and f- uh, fiduciary responsibility. So I appreciate you taking time, Kyle. Uh, you know, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Cool, cool. So uh, give us give us a brief background, Kyle, as to you know how you got started and you know how you sort of came about uh, into uh, you know real estate syndications. And I know you're doing uh, great deals, uh, so you know I'm excited to hear about what's happening with you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks again for having me on. Uh, started investing back in 2010, and when I first started investing, I didn't think I would ever do it as a full time career. Mm-hmm. At that time, I was a regional manager for a golf management company, mm-hmm. so very similar to property management for uh, apartments, just property management for for golf courses. So mm-hmm. I was oversaw about 250 employees, 20 million in revenue, and I really loved my job and what I did. Mm-hmm. I grew up playing golf, and uh, so it was natural that I got in the golf business. But um, so in 2010, my first investment was really my primary residence. I house hacked it. Mm-hmm. So bought a bought a property that needed a lot of work, moved some friends in, fixed it up while I lived in there and basically lived uh, mortgage free because my, my friends paid for my mortgage. Sure. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, you know, in 2013, I read the purple book, mo- like most people. And, uh, you know, Robert Kiyosaki says that your primary residence is a, a liability, not an asset. Sure. And I truly mm-hmm. believe that now. And so, you know, I, I actually sold my house and took all the equity out of that and started buying some single family homes mm-hmm. um, in the Midwest. I did mm-hmm. that for a few years and I learned quickly that it's tough to scale with single family homes. Um, and I certainly wanted a little bit more control. So at that point, I, I bought nine of them. And um, at that point in my career, it was around 2015 after I um, had uh, purchased about nine single families, I was actually looking to leave the golf industry. Uh, the golf industry mm-hmm. was shrinking, my company was shrinking, and I wanted to continue to grow as, you know, in my field and in my industry. Um, and so for two years, I kind of wandered around aimlessly trying to find what that next career path was going to be for me, and I, and I couldn't find it. Mm-hmm. And so um, one day, I just started searching on the internet, and I found something called multifamily, and I was like, hmm, you know what, this is interesting. I invest, I have my real estate license, you know, for the last seven years, I know quite a bit about real estate. Mm -hmm. So I started educating myself and I found an online course. I took that online course and uh, 11 months later, I left my full-time job to uh, pursue this full-time. So, you know, multifamily is an amazing industry and I I fell in love with it pretty immediately because I understood it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, driving income, controlling expenses, putting systems into place to hold things accountable, all that kind of stuff is everything I did for the last 15 years. And so it just made perfect sense to me. And uh, here I am now. Awesome. Awesome. Now you said, uh, Kyle, that you uh, have been already investing in single family houses. You had about nine of them, right? And um, was there some disconnect uh, uh, between, you know, what you were doing uh, perhaps, you know, why not grow the single family? I mean, you know, what attracted you to multifamily in general? Yeah, a couple different things. So single family, it's definitely tougher to scale because it's just individual properties kind of spread out, right? And I was trying sure. to get in three different markets, um, but also financing after your 10th home becomes difficult because 
you now need to go with commercial financing. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I hit nine, I started thinking, okay, what am I going to do mm -hmm. um, after my 10th? And that's when I found multifamily. Mm -hmm. And the thing I love about multifamily is, you know, in single family, it's very singular. Um, one property sits next to the other. If they're identical houses, they're going to sell for pretty much the same price, very close, right? Sure, sure. Um, mm -hmm. But with multifamily, if you have two identical properties, the one that is operated more efficiently, the one creating a higher NOI is going to sure. sell for more. And so you have more control over that. You have more um, sources of income and sure. you can, and there's more expenses to where if you're efficient and, um, you know, you add value back in the property, you can save there as well. So there's multiple ways to um, get value out of a property for multifamily where it's very similar with single family. So that's what I really loved. And mm -hmm. my background in operations and management really appealed towards multifamily. Right, right. I, I like to, you know, hear that's such a nice perspective. And it's a little different than, you know, sort of my background where I was pretty much doing the same, uh, like what you're stating, Kyle, is that, uh, you know, just buying one house at a time, one house at a time. Sometimes, you know, obviously I bought through the crash as well. And uh, pretty much there were times when I was buying, you know, 10, 12 houses a month, literally, you know, it sounds pretty unbelievable, but that's the fact, right? And it's an interesting dynamic where I think, uh, and, and I, I interview experts like you from, let's say, West Coast or some places where, you know, like, let's say, New York or uh, some other markets where it's absolutely impossible to buy anything. So you are obviously looking for, uh, you know, assets that are away. But in my story, the way it happened was I was always local. So I was always like looking at <laughs> houses in my backyard. And I never realized that, oh, geez, you know, I could still buy, you know, a lot, lot of larger multifamily. And it's interesting, the point of perspective you bring in, and also you rightfully said that if you're buying these many houses on, on all these different markets, it's like, how are you going to finance? How are you going to manage those things, mm -hmm. right? And here I was, I was everything local. So I was like packaging 10 houses at a time and going, doing a commercial loan. What seemed to be pretty straightforward to me, but now when I interview experts like you, it's like, it's just a complete 360. It's like, Oh yes, I mean th th that's absolutely right. And, and and the interesting thing also is that we all come to the conclusion that yes, multifamily is way to go. But I think arriving to that conclusion, it's it's very interesting that you come out, <laughs> to, you know, on a on a very uh, sort of on different ta tangents, but still, you know, you are in multifamily. So I love to hear your story. Like, um, give us a, a sense of uh, you know sort of your initial uh, uh, sort of start, Kyle. That uh, you said uh, that you took on a mentor and things like that. You took the online coaching and stuff, right? Uh, so help us, you know, break down that um, why you decided to take the coaching and why not like maybe try to establish the broker relations and, you know, go through the normal route. Uh, I'm just curious to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, it just happened uh, naturally. I found a course online and so I took the course and then mm -hmm. I fell in love with it and they kind of upsold me into the coaching. But looking back at it now, I'm glad that I did it because mm -hmm. multifamily is operating multi-million dollar businesses. When you buy an apartment building, you're buying a business. Sure. When you're buying a single family home, you can do that on your own. You know, you can sure. figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. But, you know, especially in our model where we're doing syndications, we're raising funds from passive investors we, we have a responsibility to our investors and their money. And so you need to be Absolutely. highly mm -hmm. educated, but there's so many different moving pieces with multifamily that, you know, if you're not educated, you can lose a lot of money. It's, it's, it's a big boys game for sure. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars. We're sure. not buying a single family home for 40 to $70,000. So, you know, I encourage anyone out there or, you know, that they should get educated first. I mean, especially with multifamily. So, you know, I'm glad we took that route and, and we were with um, that coaching program for a year and we didn't do our first deal for a year and a half, you know? Mm -hmm. So we spent the first 12 months really educating ourselves, making sure that we understood what we were getting into, the benefits, the risks, um, all those types of things. And then during that time as well, we were uh, building our investor database. But, you know, I certainly would not, um, advise anybody getting into multifamily just trying to figure it out on their own because there's just so many things that you don't know sure, and sure. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot more money when you're playing in this game 
Absolutely. I mean, there's just so many details that you rightfully said that you have to be educated. You also said, Kyle, that um, you were building the investor database, right? Uh, give us some sense of, uh, you know, what sort of specific things you were doing. And uh, it's very interesting that, you know, you re you realized early on that you, you have to think long term and build the database and have the investors and things like that. So give us a sense of some of the things that you did to uh, you know, align yourself and, you know, have a pool of investors around you. Yeah. And this goes back to education. I think if I would have started on my own, I would not have known to do this from the very beginning. And it would have taken me a lot longer to get to where we are, mm -hmm. you know, but all the mentors that we had paid mentors and unpaid mentors, whether reading a book, listening to a podcast or, or from our coaching, it was all about, you know, making sure that you get started, you're telling people what you want to do and building that database immediately. So mm -hmm. we were able to build the database for 18 months until we need to use it. Mm -hmm. And so along with that, you know, you're nurturing those relationships, you're building up confidence and, mm -hmm. and all those different things. But the first thing that we did was we uh, started a meetup. Actually, the first thing we did, we started a monthly newsletter, which there weren't very many people on that newsletter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in order to get more people on that newsletter, we started a meetup. Mm -hmm. um, and gradually started to grow that and going to conferences, trading business cards, things like that. Sure. Um, and then, you know, if you take a look at how many platforms we have now, it may be overwhelming, but just know that this has been over the last two and a half, three years that we've been building these. So now we have, you know, the next progression was we started a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, we actually started two more meetups. And then after that, we started mm -hmm. uh, doing webinars online. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so now we've got three meetups. We do online webinars once a month, uh, podcast that airs uh, twice a week. Now we have two different segments, mm -hmm. um, our meetups. And then also we're launching a conference here in September on asset management. So, you know, there's slow natural progressions. You sure. kind of add one, you perfect it, you go to the next one, but I'm a firm believer of the more kind of fishing lines you have in the ocean, the likelier you are to, to catch a fish, right? So we're trying to um, continue to add value to people um, and put out as much value and education as we possibly can. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I like the fishing analogy that you are, you know, having multiple hooks uh, uh, sort of uh, in the water and you're more likely to, you know, attract more fishes or investors here uh, through all those different channels. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, tell us the name of your podcast and what, what different things you like to talk about in that time. Yeah, thanks for that. So it's passive income through multifamily real estate. And uh, we have two episodes. The Monday episode is geared more towards educating passive investors on how to get started and really the things that you should know mm -hmm. uh, before you do get started. And then our mm -hmm. Friday episode are shorter episodes that are focused on asset management. So for more mm -hmm. for active investors who are looking to be educated on, hey, you know, I just closed my first deal, mm -hmm. or maybe I have several deals, but how can I be a better operator? How can mm -hmm. I get the most out of my properties? And I think it's, it's perfect timing with the whole COVID situation now. You know, asset management is something that is, is crucial. Absolutely. And, uh, being talked mm -hmm. about more and more now. So uh, that Friday episode is really to help and educate people on how to become a better asset manager. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and I think uh, you rightfully said that with COVID hitting, I think that was one of the overlooked areas all the time that like mm -hmm. nobody really wanted to talk about, but it's such a uh, central piece. Like, I, I mean, I always feel that property management and asset management are just two strong pillars, you know, that kind of, you know, keep the glue going, you know, absolutely. Uh, now explain us, uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about, you know, how your first deal came about, Kyle. Yeah, so our first deal, when we um, first got it, I had just left my job. So I left my job in November. We got it under contract in January. But the reason we were able to get it was while I had my full-time job, while my wife had her full-time job, we would always take one weekday off um, a month and mm -hmm. we would drive to our market. And so we would drive to Tucson, which is eight and a half hours. So we leave at two in the wow. morning, mm -hmm. get there at like nine, nine thirty. We would meet with brokers and property management companies, tour as many properties as we can, mm -hmm. and then come back the next morning at like one in the morning. And so, um, you know, it was one of those things where we're doing something that other people were not doing. We were making sure we we're getting out to our market every month. And uh, on one of those trips, you know, obviously I would schedule appointments in advance, but sure. on mm -hmm. one of them, one of the brokers called me and said, Hey Kyle, I literally just got the keys to this apartment. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we just signed it last night. Do you want to come see it? So it wasn't on my schedule, but wow. we were touring mm-hmm. properties with a, a property management company that we were confident we were going to go with. And so we all met there. We liked mm-hmm. the property. And since we were there, we were able to also tour the comps around the area as well with our property management company. So mm-hmm. we were the very first people to see it as far as investors are concerned. Mm-hmm. And three weeks later, we got it under contract and uh, kind of the rest is history. Wow. Wow. I mean, there's just so much value, so much to unpack through there. I mean, driving eight and a half hours, leaving two o'clock uh, in the morning to get there and like, you know, at, at sort of, you know, when people start working, that's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, that's such dedication and such passion to pursue, uh, you know, sort of your goals. Uh, now, explain us. Uh, there are definitely some follow-up questions I have I, uh, for you, Kyle, there. But in terms of you said Tucson, right? And you're driving, let's say, eight hours from there. Help us understand what was it attractive about Tucson that you wanted to be there, but perhaps not three hours from your uh, home base, you know? Uh, why drive eight hours? I mean, what was attractive about Tucson that you wanted to be there, I guess? Yeah, so I think to start, our first, um, you know, our first market of choice is really Phoenix, um, mm-hmm. a larger market for sure. And um, we really liked it. And it's five, it's, that's a five hour drive. It's only a one hour flight. California mm-hmm. is where I live. It's not the most landlord friendly state. And sure. it's really not a high cash flow state. It's more of a buy and hold and appreciation kind of play uh, in California. Sure. Mm-hmm. There, And look, there's ways to make millions of dollars in any market. You just have to know the game you're playing. And so we are more of cash flow type of uh, players along with the value add forced depreciation play. So Mm -hmm. we were visiting Phoenix and the prices out there were, you know, the cap rates were pretty low already. Competition was high. And every time I went out there, the brokers were saying, Kyle, I think you should check out Tucson. I think you should check out Tucson. And Mm -hmm. I actually was not very... um, confident in the market, but we took their advice. We went, we went out there a couple of times, toured some properties, did some more research on the market. And mm-hmm. really we fell in love with it. I, I loved the Tucson market. You know, the cost um, for, for living out there is much lower. Um, mm-hmm. Great job, still a million in the MSA. Uh, as far as population, rent growth, job growth, job diversity, all those metrics are, are met in the Tucson market. Mm-hmm. Um, and the price per unit was very attractive. So um, that's when we started going down there. And so we started hitting both Phoenix and Tucson um, and, and slowly got to learn that market. I think that's the other thing too to note is, you know, we were looking in that market for 12 months before we bought. Wow. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we really got to learn the market and understand the market and the pockets you don't want to buy in and the pockets where it's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we found Tucson. Awesome. Awesome. Now you said um, very important there, Kyle, is that you were visiting the market and you were, uh, you know, looking at all these different things, right? Uh, how were you knowing that, okay, this, uh, this block or this part of uh, Tucson is better than the other part? Uh, was that like purely through sort of your physical presence and going there, learning the market? Or is there anything you uh, read the reports or talk to investors or perhaps consult brokers? How, how, can, how do you get some of that human intelligence, basically? Yeah, all of that, for sure. You know, any reports that we can read from the, uh, on a market perspective, we do read. Mm-hmm. Um, anything that we can uh, count on investors who are local, brokers who are local. You know, at first we talked to a bunch of brokers and property management companies and said, here's a map of Tucson. Tell us mm-hmm. where we should and should not go. And we kind of use that at first. But I think the real separator for us is that we're out there so often. I mean, mm-hmm. pre-COVID, I'm out in that market every two weeks. Right. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And I don't live in that market. And so the more you're out there, the more you get to start to see some gentrification in certain areas, the more you see certain things at night that aren't good in this area and things like that. Mm-hmm. And a market report is an update on a quarterly basis or maybe a yearly basis. Mm-hmm. So I think they definitely lag in information when sure. you're out there you're seeing it firsthand. So I think that's important, but we use other tools like citydata.com and neighborhood scout and local market monitor, which are some paid, Mm -hmm. paid uh, tools that we use to make sure we're taking a look at, at every um, aspect of the, of the market. But um, Mm -hmm. really there's no, nothing that separates you more than actually being in the market and watching it turn. Sure, sure, sure. Very well said. Very well said. And and also Kyle uh, talking about broker relations, right? Like, How did you start developing the initial broker contacts uh, and zeroing in on those, you know? 
Yeah, it was not easy. And, you know, I'm a, an introvert uh, by nature and I've mm -hmm. become more of an extrovert now. I, I still think I'm more of an introvert, um, but definitely much better. But uh, it was basically making a list. I have, I still have a list of over 60 brokers between the two markets mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I call them every other week. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did, you know, and certain ones don't ever answer and I leave a message and follow up with an email and other ones do answer. And, you know, over the last two years, I've been able to develop pretty good relationships with them. Um, that's awesome. and, mm -hmm. and then not just that, but when I go out, we always make sure we meet with a broker, whether it's buy them coffee or buy them lunch or dinner or anything that we can, we always incorporate meeting face to face, mm -hmm. to continue mm -hmm. to establish that relationship. But I can tell you right now that some of the brokers out there, I still, still don't have the strongest relationship with, and I want to continue to strengthen that. Mm -hmm. And it just takes time. You know, there's a ton of investors out there who, who want to invest in the market and, um, it, quite frankly, waste the time of the brokers. And you've got to prove that you're a legitimate buyer, a legitimate investor, and also that you're someone that cares about their well-being as well, not just, hey, do you have a deal? No, okay. Yeah, uh, I know. Send me, I hear send you there. The deal, <laughs> and then you never hear from them again. So right. it really takes time to develop and establish those relationships. Doesn't mean you can't get a deal done when you're first getting started, but sure. as yeah. you nurture those relationships, certainly the deal flow um, is going to continue to get better. Absolutely, absolutely. And and you rightfully said that I think once you have maybe perhaps first deal closed or something, you know, brokers suddenly will present you with a lot more, uh, you know, sort of deals and, you know, take you more seriously, you know. Uh, now share with us, Kyle, like how, how was your sort of first deal, how it came about? Yeah, so I, I mentioned that we were able to find it uh, through mm -hmm. the broker. Three weeks later, we ended up getting it under contract. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, this goes back to being educated. I had never been through, you know, getting a property, a multifamily property in escrow and mm -hmm. working with an agency lender. Mm -hmm. um, so we went with Freddie, um, a small balance loan on our first mm -hmm. deal. And I learned so much. And mm -hmm. we actually had to change our lender 29 days before close oh, after wow. we had already used an extension mm -hmm. because of some things that happened. Now we mm -hmm. ended up benefiting from it because it's when the rates dropped, we actually ended up getting a 81 basis point discount on our interest rate, wow. which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, we learned quite a bit during that process mm -hmm. and uh, it's all about having people on your team that have been there before mm -hmm. so that they know to expect certain things. And I, I did not have that at first and we ended up going with uh, adding some um, of our partners onto that deal after the fact when we switched over um, and it was a much smoother process. And actually that partnership led into the partnership of our larger deal in Phoenix uh, just three weeks later. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll get to that as well, uh, Kyle. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, now, Kyle, uh, what were some of the things that you said that you you ended up changing the lender? Was that something that the lender was difficult or you were not getting the terms you were desiring? What was about it? Yeah, so we used a, a broker for, for the lender. Um, and so this um, particular broker, they're very popular. And I just think that, number one, my my inexperience when I first got started mm -hmm. in this environment, coupled with a little bit of miscommunication resulted mm -hmm. in us having to change. But basically what happened is we were going to do this deal all ourselves. And when I say my, ourselves, it was my wife and I, and our I parents see. were going to sign on the loan mm -hmm. and we were going to raise the funds and do everything on our own. Mm -hmm. um, well, how much was the loan size and the total, like sort of the, uh, let's say the capital needed what purchase price and all that? Uh, yeah, the raise was right at a million. The purchase price is 1.65. Okay, uh, got it. Mm -hmm. Smaller deal, 42 unit deal. So we mm -hmm. felt like we were well prepared to, to do that. But as a backup, what we told the lender was, look, if we do not feel comfortable that we can raise the full amount in the first couple of weeks, we're, we're going to, excuse me, test it out. <coughs> we're not there then we want to bring on a partner to help out with, with mm -hmm. everything, you know, mm -hmm. sign on the loan, asset manage, and then raise the rest of the capital. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, but I did that over the phone verbally. I did not have any email communication over it. Mm -hmm. So three mm -hmm. weeks in, you know, we were about halfway raised and I was feeling like we could get there, but I wasn't a hundred percent confident. So I mm -hmm. said, you know what, right now it's just better to make sure we can close than mm -hmm. to take the deal on all by ourselves. So we mm -hmm. already had two other partners that we were looking at other deals together. I just happened to bring this one under contract just before that. Mm -hmm. And so they were interested in coming on the deal. 
Um, and I was told by the lender, sorry, it's too late. We've already submitted your application to Freddie Mac and there's nothing we can do. They don't want to re underwrite the deal. Oh boy. And mm -hmm. so I begged them for three weeks actually. Um, mm -hmm. and they said, no, 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 no. And I said, okay, well, I don't have another choice. I have to bail on you guys because I don't want to number one, risk our investors capital and number sure. two, not be able to close on this loan. So mm -hmm. it was literally a Hail Mary. It was a Friday night. It was 4 PM <laughs> in California. And my business partner said, Hey, look, I, I've never met this guy, but I've heard of his name. Let me look up his number online. He was able to find his number online and he was in New York. Mm -hmm. This guy walking off a cruise ship uh -huh. at seven o'clock, or actually it was seven o'clock our time, 10 o'clock their time. Oh boy. And he, and he answered. <laughs> oh, nice. And he, said, <laughs> and he said, look, by the end of the I need you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he said, look, send this stuff over. I'll take a look at this weekend. I'll get you an answer by Monday. On Sunday evening, he said, we can do this. We'll close in 29 days. It ended up being a, a Fannie Mae loan. And um, we had to trust him. It was a Hail Mary. I, mm -hmm. I never want to be put in that position again. We closed right on the dot in the closing time and 29 days later. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really about the communication and we didn't get it in writing from the lender. The, the thing that w really was disappointing is that when on the last day when we said, okay, we are going to switch lenders, sorry, they said, okay, we can do it now. Oh. And that really is something that upset me because the three weeks that I was begging them, it was a very stressful time. It was our first deal. Wasn't sure if we were going to get it closed. And so, you know, that's where it really goes back to being educated or having sure. a team member that is educated because we could have saved ourselves a lot of time, stress, um, being with someone that, that was educated in that. No, I agree with you. I think there are just some of these so many nuances are there within the process and you know what lenders are doing and you don't know how it impacts to the total picture of the thing and, and you rightfully said that i think surrounding with like the like-minded people or you know having a coach uh next to you to kind of see some of those hidden turns uh, as i call it sometimes uh, those are the things you have to watch for now just shifting gears a little bit uh, uh kyle here you said uh, your next deal was a much larger 15 million dollar deal uh, mm -hmm. you just alluded to um I mean, it sounds pretty good to be true that, you know, within three, four weeks, here you are mm -hmm. just doing another, uh, like a monster deal, like almost, uh, you know, 10 times the size, right? Uh, give us some sense of, you know, how it came about. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to grasp myself. It's just, just too good to be true. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. They always say the law of the first deal. You know, once you do that first deal, more deals will come. And um, three weeks after we closed on our first property, mm -hmm. one of my partners that we brought on to that first property, he has property in Phoenix already. And so oh, he, called, he mm -hmm. called me and he said, hey, Kyle, I got this deal. It's not up to market yet. We've got about a week to get a sneak peek. Mm -hmm. And he has a full-time job and he knew I did this full-time. He said, hey, look, underwrite it. I think it has you know, some, um, some Potential positive things right. about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we underwrote it. And then me and my other business partner were out there the next day touring it. Mm -hmm. The next day we made an offer and it was under contract. And so uh, it happened extremely quickly. But again, the one thing that we did is we didn't waste any time. We drove out there. We showed the broker that we were very interested and that mm -hmm. we were serious. And the biggest benefit was that one of our um, partners had closed two deals with this brokerage and so sure. they were mm -hmm. able to have that relationship where they were able to see it before it went to market so that's awesome you know there's there's definitely that mutual trust that okay yes these guys are legit and i think uh, you rightfully said that you acted with speed and that speed sometimes can save you thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars you know <laughs> yeah 100 percent, especially in a hot market right if you're yeah. not acting on it quickly um you know, you're, you're at a disadvantage and likely will lose out on a deal. Sure, sure. Uh, give us some specifics as to, you know, how many units, what sort of uh, rent numbers and things like that on that, uh, Kyle? Yep. So this one's 128 units in Phoenix, uh, about a $15 million deal and uh, majority two beds, one bath. So mm -hmm. the rents right now, we're getting above 1200 about 1250 on those two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. The average weighted is around 800 Oh, wow. um, when, we, mm -hmm. when we bought it. So, you know, mm -hmm. anywhere between a 300 to uh, $350 to $400 rent bump on the two bedrooms. So, wow, that's, um, that's impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the one thing we did is add washer dryers, I think, um, which is mm -hmm. important right now and mm -hmm. uh, in that market um, and definitely it, there's demand for it. But uh, the previous syndic uh, previous owner was a syndicator actually um, mm -hmm. and was just at the end of their business plan. And that market had appreciated so much Mm -hmm. um, over the last five years, 
he really didn't have to fully execute his business plan in mm. order to get the end result. Sure, sure. So, so there was definitely some, uh, what do you call it, some money left on the table. Yeah, uh, meat left on say. the bone for sure. sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting. So now, how do you take on these projects, Kyle, in terms of the value adds or some of the renovations that you're doing? Give us some philosophy as to, um, you know, how you go about it. What are like, as soon as you, uh, let's say, acquire the asset, what sort of immediate things you're doing just to, you know, kind of make yourself visible of sorts? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head right there. Make ourselves visible, right? Make sure the current resident base uh, knows that we're going there to improve the property, to put Mm -hmm. money back into the property and to make it a better property for them to live at. Mm -hmm. And then number two, any new residents seeing things changing as well. So Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. that, you know, a lot of value add is on interior renovations, but Mm -hmm. we don't focus on that first. The thing that we really like to focus on is exterior and curb appeal. So, Mm -hmm. you know, on this property in Phoenix, we hit the, the outside signage and the landscaping. It's the first thing that you see signage mm-hmm. around the property, things like that, cleaning it up, painting. Uh, those are all things that we really like to focus on so that when you're walking around, you can see that this property is well-maintained, well-kept, and they care about the property. You know, you can do a lot of interior renovations, but the only person seeing that interior renovation is the person touring it and the person renting it up, right? So sure. the mm-hmm. existing clientele, they're not seeing anything added back into the property. And when you go to raise the rents, they're thinking, well, why, why are we getting a rent bump here of 200 bucks or, or whatever it is sure. mm-hmm. when you have not improved anything for me? You know, you're not right. going and renovating an existing tenant's unit. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's really important, depending on the property that you're buying, is to really focus first on deferred maintenance because that's really going to uh, reduce your expenses and then exterior curb appeal. I see. So Kyle, you're always looking for value add uh, opportunities. I mean, uh, and and the reason I ask is that you are in such a hot market and you also alluded there that the prior owner uh, probably didn't have to, uh, you know, uh, sort of do as much of a a hard work because they were already probably uh, surpassing their performer numbers, right? And where I'm going with this question also is that value add deals can also sometimes come with risk right and it depends how we ma- mitigate the risk but you are in uh, you know you're targeting let's say phoenix market which uh, perhaps is one of the hottest markets right now so uh, are you maybe thinking perhaps also is that um, why not do just like a yield play meaning you buy and you perhaps you know increase the rents as organically as possible what are your thoughts on some of that yeah, I love value add play because you can force the value, right? Sure. Um, I certainly understand where you're coming from as far as a yield play. It's certainly quote unquote safer. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we're not going in there doing heavy value adds. Mm-hmm. We're still purchasing properties that cash flow on day one sure. with the new debt on them. So mm-hmm. I think our, our um, business model is value add, but it's a mm-hmm. hybrid between cash flow and, or a yield play and mm-hmm. a value add play. Mm -hmm. where, you know, we're not going in and we're not vacating a property. Uh, We're not putting in 30, 40 grand a unit and completely rebuilding it. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a hybrid between a yield play and a value add play. But I just love the sense that you have the option to force value um, at a property. Now, that's where knowing your market, knowing the neighborhood where you're buying, and really not being the first to test the market is important. We're not going into an area where they've never achieved these types of rents before, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. they've never achieved these types of interior renovations before. Other people are already doing it, and we're modeling after those, and then Mm -hmm. obviously implementing our systems and our operations experience to uh, better drive the NOI and get a more efficient uh, business running. So, um, yeah. Got it, got it, and 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 I guess it's it's safe to say that you are relying on the expertise of the property management company to kind of give you the assurance that hey, if you renovate to such and such extent, this is the sort of the rent differential that you would uh, uh, achieve. Uh, would that be a correct statement, Kyle? Yes, but we don't rely fully on them. You know, mm-hmm. I, I certainly think that when you're first getting started, you rely a lot 
uh, much more on the property management company, which is why it's really important to vet out as many property management companies as sure. possible and don't just pick one. But I think you also need to do your own due diligence. And so we tour a ton of properties in the local area to really see where our comps are. We don't just go online and get our comps. We walk them, we tour them, we shop them. We understand what our competition is looking like. And then we mm -hmm. say, okay, well, here's the level of their renovation. This is what they're getting. What can we do? And then, you know, before we even closed, we had a several hour conversation with our property management company mm -hmm. who has in-house um, rehab team sure. to figure out exactly what we're going to be looking like. But yes, mm -hmm. we do rely on the property management company, but at the same time, we also rely on our own due diligence. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's very important, like boots on the ground and, you know, personally seeing everything before you can, you know, sort of uh, uh, take the deal down. Um, that's, that's awesome. I appreciate that uh, uh, advice, uh, Kyle. Uh, tell our listeners, uh, Kyle, that how are passive investors, uh, you know, attracted to your deals? Like, what are you do doing different things to, you know, keep your communication going right now? Yeah, we do as much education and value mm -hmm. add as possible. So we're always trying to add value back to our investors and to anyone who's interested in learning. So like I said, all those platforms that we have, we even mm -hmm. have a YouTube channel, um, monthly newsletter. It's all about consistency when sure. you're communicating with people. I think, you know, if you have a newsletter and sometimes it goes out on the first, sometimes you miss a month and, and things like that, same as a podcast, right? Sure. Um, you're not going to really attract someone, but when you're organized, professional and have consistency, that's been the biggest key for us. So our newsletter goes out at 10 a.m. on the first of every month. You know, our webinars are the same day. Our communication to investors are very consistent. Um, so that's kind of where the consistency is key. But we just focus on trying to educate and add as much value and build relationships. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Kyle. I love to dig into, you know, a lot more topics, but I know we have a, a time crunch. So I appreciate your time today. Uh, tell our listeners how they can find you more and tell us more about, you know, some of the upcoming happenings around you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, best way to find us is at aptcapitalgroup.com and we have a free passive investors guide there for anyone that wants to check that out. But the thing that I'm really most excited about is we're having an asset management summit that we're launching in September, awesome. September mm -hmm. 21st. It's completely free and um, it's educating people about asset management, which I think there's a huge gap in the market on right now. And sure. so the website on that is amsummit2020.com. And, and uh, check that out. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. And, and we're really excited. And uh, we've got a great speaker lineup that are going to help educate people, both passive investors and active investors, I think, on things that you need to learn after you close on a deal. Um, what happens then? You know, how do you get the best out of your property? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So it's been a pleasure, uh, Kyle. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your time today. Um, I know we are just short on time today, but I love to dig into a lot more topics. Uh, you are such a uh, knowledgeable guest. So it's always a pleasure to learn from uh, someone like you. So I wish you best and I look forward to, uh, you know, working with you again uh, on a future podcast episode. Yeah, I would love to come back on and thanks for having me on. I had a good time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.